thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I've spent a great afternoon in Fort Collins, been around. I went to Spring Creek Gardens, coming to life, beautiful things there. Saw many of the plants that were there that we're going to be talking about tonight. Went out to Pat Hayward's great garden out where she and Joel live in Masonville. So I've been um, taking the tour around and it was great. I've never been to Masonville before, so uh, I've always been intrigued with it, especially since Lauren had her great garden there and I've seen many, many photos and heard Lauren talk about it, but just to be in that environment is great. So I'm happy to be with you tonight. And of course this is, we just came off of Arbor Day last Friday. Now we're at Earth Day um, today or tomorrow and all kinds of environmental stuff that we've been seeing on television this week, which is great. And again, connecting us to the natural world, which is so important. So my talk tonight is let's get X-rated. So, you know, there's a little provocateur in me. And during the drought, uh, which we really got the wake up call in 2001, 2002, Garden Centers of Colorado, Colorado State University, the green industry as a whole, wanted to come up with a program that would emphasize Xeriscape, the beauty of Xeriscape, the fundamentals of Xeriscape, and that not all Xeri plants are created equal. Some are a little bit more hardcore than others. See, there's that X-rated little thing there. Some are less hardcore than others. So we came up with the rating of single X, double X, and triple X. And meaning that the most hardcore plants as far as their tolerance of extended dry conditions would be those that got the moniker of triple X rated plants. Double X are still very water thrifty. There's more of them than there are the triple X. And single X are still water thrifty. There's many, many of them. And we're not gonna look at the single X's tonight. We only have time to really look at triple and double. Because those are the ones that we really want to emphasize if we're looking at, you know, over the long haul, those plants that are going to be able to really kind of withstand the vagaries of our climate. And we have really kind of been given a little pass here in the last couple of years, uh, primarily because of good snowpack. Last year was a pretty wet year, um, comparatively speaking. So. You know, these plants weren't totally unhappy last year. It's not that they're unhappy with getting a little bit more moisture, but when the going gets tough, they can still keep on going. So your brochure that you have on the X-rated does give you a good overview of the principles of Xeriscape and um, some indications or guidelines as far as watering is concerned, because the triple X plants Really, they can go for, you know, once they're established, many of them, I'm gonna point out a couple in here tonight, that once they're established, they really don't need any additional irrigation. They're very happy with what they get from Mother Nature. The double X plants typically would be happiest if they were getting some water on a somewhat regular basis, but not, cons not you know, every day, every week, et cetera. Usually about an inch of water every other week. So when you stop to think about it, that's not a lot. And if we've had moisture, if Mother Nature has blessed us with moisture, then that probably takes it out of your hands. So one guideline on watering that I always like to tell people is that it's not how frequently you water that is important, it's how thoroughly you water when you water. It's better to water less frequently, but when you do water, give your plants a good drink of water. Do that job, then they can sustain themselves, and you know they're gonna be much happier. Shallow frequent waterings are the kiss of death for a lot of plants. And there will be a few plants in here that we'll talk about that overwatering them is not the happiest thing for them. So to get right to it, our first plant that we're looking at tonight 
is the Mount Atlas daisy, the little Anacyclus depressus. What a depressing species name. Where did they come up with that? But at any rate, a little indication from its common name as to why this is a triple X plant, the Mount Atlas Mountains in northern Africa. This is a dry place. This plant is native to that climate. It will withstand a lot of drought here. Not a diminutive plant, it will get some growth on it, but it really has those characteristics of a lot of the plants that really are very drought tolerant. It has fine textured foliage. The fine textured foliage is more silvery and gray in color. It will transpire much less than that. One attractive uh, characteristic of this plant that doesn't show here, unfortunately, is that when before it opens up in the morning and the petals are reflexed up, it has beautiful red marking on the back of the petals. And then, so it gives it kind of a bicolored look, and then as it opens, you get the pure white daisy. But, and another note as we go through, unless I note that it is a shade or part shade plant, all of these plants are full sun. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on height, width, space, and things. You've got the list here. I will denote if something is really considered more of a ground cover, which I would say this plant is and uh, then gives you a good jumping off point for doing a little bit more research on the plants. The next plant, and someone was very interested in ground covers tonight. So Antenaria, the little pussy toes, a great little ground cover plant. This is a plant that is native in our foothills in Montane region. So it's very useful. It's great around paving. There is a whole brand of plants called Steppables, that are sort of touted for the fact that they can tolerate quote unquote light foot traffic um, in and around stepping stones. You're not gonna probably make a solid path of this, but one of the beautiful things about Antenaria is that this is a plant that will keep its foliage evergreen throughout the year, ever silver, we might say. So a very useful plant for us and just a pretty little plant. When it flowers, it puts up a short little stem um, with a little cluster of flowers that when they're in the bud, look like a little upturned pussy toe type thing. So uh, lots of clever ways of naming plants. And many of you are familiar with these plants. There are nothing new about these plants, but these are very, very tough plants. One of my favorites in this is a prairie native, the Asclepias tuberosa butterfly weed. And butterfly weed is becoming more and more available as a container plant. For many years, it was difficult to find good butterfly weed as a container plant. It doesn't like to stay in a pot very long. It likes to have you purchase it, it likes to get planted, and it wants full sun and it wants to be dry. Asclepias is a plant that puts down a deep tap root. So once it establishes, it does not like to be disturbed. The other indicator about this plant, and one reason why a lot of people who plant it lose it, is because it is extremely late to come out of dormancy in the spring. It doesn't really show its little new growth until the middle of May, oftentimes late May. It likes warm temperatures. Many of these plants will have that characteristic. So if you planted a, pus or a, a butterfly weed last year and you're just going, where is it? Why hasn't it come up yet? So you get the trowel or a little stick that you pick up in the, on the ground somewhere and you go poking around where you know that you planted it because you're searching for it. You wanna see some vestige of life. Well, don't do that. Don't disturb it. When it goes dormant in the fall, mark it with a stake where it is so that you know where you planted it, but then just be patient and let it come up on its own and don't, you know, stab it with a stick, a trowel, whatever. It's not gonna be happy about that. And where you plant it is where it's going to want to stay. Now, another characteristic about this plant is that this is a wonderful plant to naturalize itself in a xeric landscape. 
and it naturalizes itself by its seed. And it flowers fairly early in the summer, usually in June, mid-June, maybe into July. Beautiful orange flowers. There are a few kind of quasi cultivars of this with a little break on the color, but the real Asclepias tuberosa is gonna be this beautiful orange color. And when it develops its seed heads, they're long, tubular, very elegant looking seed heads. Aphids love them, so just if aphids congregate on them, just wash them off. But when they ripen in the fall, those elegant little tubular capsules will open and there is a whole raft of silken seeds in there. Little brown seeds with silken tassels. They will distribute themselves around and probably the hardiest of your butterfly weeds that you will have in your garden are not the ones that you plant from containers but the ones that establish themselves where they self-sow and really put that root down and establish that root system as a seedling plant. So this is a plant that we don't want you to deadhead to make more flowers or to make it bushier or anything like that. Let it go to seed, let it naturalize. And you'll, you'll kind of learn the characteristics of the stem, the leaves, everything. And believe me, it's very gratifying when you see your first seedlings of butterfly weed come up and you go, that's where it wants to be. So you might have to move something from out from around it in order to make it happy there. Or as a very small seedling, you could transplant it somewhere where you wanted it. But after it once puts down that taproot, let's leave it alone. Now, Calero, little wine cup, prairie wine cup. This was a plant select recommendation way, way back. I'm gonna say, 1998 or do I have the year there? 1998, I do have. So this is a native plant from our eastern prairies. And this first slide here shows you what the clump of foliage looks like when it comes out of dormancy in the spring. But actually this clump of foliage is a picture that I took at Kendrick Lake Garden in Lakewood, Colorado on August 30th of last year. Because you all know what happened on July 20th in the western suburbs of the metro area last year. We had a tornadic hailstorm that arrived very suddenly at 1035 at night and decimated everything that was in its path. So the gardens at Kendrick Lake were completely laid flat. One month after that activity, this is the new growth that emerged from everything that had happened there. So this gives you an idea of the resiliency of these plants. And here is little wine cup in its beautiful state with its magenta cups. Again, this is a member of the mallow family. And once again, like many of these Plains natives, this does not come out of dormancy early. It's going to be late, so don't expect it to show up probably until late May or early in June. And then once it gets up, gets going, and it is what we call kind of a weaver plant, a trailer, a rambler. It basically comes from one growing point, but it will trail through the garden and kind of intermingle uh, with other plants. And if, once it starts blooming, uh, early to midsummer, it just keeps on blooming all the way. So very good, but the first hard freeze, you're gonna know, because the little wine cup will go, okay, I'm done for the year, it's too cold. Centranthus, Jupiter's beard, one that has been around for years and years and years. No new plant here, but a very tough plant. One that will kind of in time possibly become a nuisance plant if you don't check the unwanted seedlings because it can, after it matures for a while, it can start coming up not only from seedlings that it will produce but also from root suckering out. So you might have to watch that a little bit. But this plant is a marvel, especially 
in late May and all the way through June. It just is a, a, a sight to behold. After it finishes that first flush of bloom, you can deadhead it down and you will see other smaller buds down along the stem. Those will come out and flower, but they're not gonna have that lush, big, humbled look like the first flowering flush does on this. But very drought tolerant, very resilient, and uh, even after it's out of flower, the foliage has got a little bit heavier texture, a little bit, on, not quite leathery, but a, ver a real heavier textured leaf that has kind of a glaucous blue-green look that's quite attractive. So over, you know, even though it's not gonna flower for you all summer long, still a good choice for extreme drought tolerance and uh, a good looking plant in the garden. Now we're back to a native plant. So someone, the, the gentleman that was really wanting to know native plants, I, I hope you're satisfied that we've got a few in here. But this is one of the Areogonums, and it was a selection from Plant Select uh, three years ago in 2007. And so this plant was really collected over on, in the Canna Creek region, which is Canna Creek runs into the Gunnison River, in the Gunnison River watershed off of Grand Mesa. And we have a lot of different species of Areogonums that are native in the, in the state. And as you drive through the mountains and the inner montane, you will see areogonums flowering all summer long. Some of them will be this sulfur yellow. Some of them will be a creamier white. They all have the characteristic of when they start to shut down in the fall, the flowers will, of the creamier white ones, turn almost a sort of a russet wine color, different shades of rosy red. They're absolutely beautiful. And one of the other great facets, and how many of you are familiar with Paniote Kelladis from Denver Botanic Gardens? You probably heard him speak. This is in his garden in southeastern Denver, and a beautiful clump here. This is really best as a sun plant, but he's growing it in part shade. It's doing quite well. There's a close-up of the flower. You can cut these flowers and dry them, and you'll have those beautiful flowers all winter long in an everlasting bouquet. They're one of the classic flowers to cut and dry. But this is at Denver Botanic Gardens in, I took this picture in February of this year, which gives you an idea of the winter foliage. So the winter foliage on all of the areogonums is very apparent during the winter. There's not the bare earth syndrome, and you do get some very nice burgundy wine colored colors in that. This plant, I think, is an interesting plant. This one is sea holly. And you got to either love this plant or hate this plant, I guess. It has a very architectural style when it flowers, so it can be a real standout. This is one of the toughest plants I've ever grown. If you maintain that foliage through the senescence of the flower when the, it shatters and the seed goes everywhere, you will have a nuisance plant on your hand because this reseeds very readily. So I would suggest if you don't want a million uh, sea hollies in your garden, that before the flower shatters, the same thing with globe thistle, very similar plant in that way, Cut the flower stems off, hang them upside down, dry them and use them inside during the winter as an everlasting. But don't let them shatter and reseed because then you could have a problem with uh, maybe too many sea hollies in your garden. But nonetheless, this is a plant that is really tough, can take, doesn't really need, once it's established, very much in the way of additional irrigation and will give you kind of this unique architectural color in your garden. Cushion spurge. This is one of the true harbingers of spring. I think when we look at, there's a number of plants, if we look at them tonight, in the way they are formed, it's that, you know, people plant natural world connection. I would imagine that Buckmeister Fuller, somewhere along the line, saw pictures of 
cushion spurge, or globe thistle, or scabiosa seed heads that we'll look at a little bit later. Somewhere there was some subliminal thing that said geodesic dome, geodesic dome, geodesic dome. Because of just the configuration of the, this mound of plants. Now, remember that this is a euphorbia, and it is related to the poinsettia. Poinsettia is euphorbia pulchera. This is euphorbia epithemoides. And the real color in cushion spurge is coming from a bract, just like the real color in your poinsettia is from a bract, which is a modified leaf that takes on color. That's where the real color comes in the cushion spurge. The little flowers are sitting down in and among those bracts and are pretty insignificant compared to what's really catching your eye. So this is chrome yellow. And it is one of the early, usually late April, early May flowers that will happen in the garden. Very, very tough plant. It looks like this for mm, a brief while, probably six weeks at the most. I'm gonna say more like five probably. And after it finishes, the color starts to fade from those bracts. It will oftentimes start to open out a little bit. It'll look a little sprawly. And usually by the middle to the end of June, it looks really sprawly. It just doesn't have the same, it doesn't have the same color. That's all gone from the early spring. And it doesn't have the same form because it's continued to grow and open out. So the maintenance on this is that when it begins to look like it needs a haircut, you give it a haircut. And you will cut all of your stems back to about probably two to four inches. And you will wait several weeks. It will look like it's been to boot camp. It just got sheared. And after about two weeks, you'll see new foliage start to emerge and develop. And then you'll have a nicely shaped, more mounded looking plant. No more blooms, no more chrome color. But as it goes into late summer and fall, that foliage is really quite beautiful with the autumnal tones that it develops. So just a little bit of the basics about maintaining that, uh, that type of a plant. Another plant that's native to the Eastern Plains, Gallardia aristata, blanket flower. And uh, easy plant to grow, easy to grow from seed. There's lots of different cultivars out there. Some that are kind of close to the straight species with the typical blanket flower coloration of red, orange, or orange, red, and yellow and some that are more predominantly yellow, some that are more predominantly red. But either way, this is a pretty easy plant to grow, although somewhat short-lived in the garden. It's a very prolific plant for flowering. It will set a lot of seed. You can have seedling plants come up from this plant. Cold, wet winters, it does not like. I guess the beauty of Gallardia is that it's easy and cheap to produce from seed, so it's generally a pretty economical plant to purchase. So you can replace ones that are lost, that you've lost over the winter very easily. And pretty much, you know, they're going to exhaust themselves if they live over the winter after about three or four years in the garden. They just really kind of bloomed themselves out. This is an old-fashioned grandmother's garden plant. Gania Lehman used to be called Status, still has the common name Status or German Status. Um, it really is a tough plant. It has a basal rosette of leaves that are thick and leathery. I mean, they are very thick, very leathery, very tough. And from that basal rosette come these sort of thin stems that will come up, but they are really branched, very heavily branched, with these very stiff, they look like coral, kind of like sea coral, because they branch out and have these little star-shaped flowers. So this is kind of a baby's breath-like plant, but a very, it's like a starched baby's breath. 
We've really put the starch in this, very stiff. You can actually pull the flower, you can pull those stems apart and make individual sprays. They are a flower arranger's delight because they can use them in so many ways. You can construct a whole wreath with a German status frame and then you got the perfect place to put in your individual little flowers to establish it. There's so many ways of using this. The flowers will last forever out in the garden. You can have that look all summer long if you want to, if you don't want to um, harvest them and make other use out of them. But this is a very, very tough plant. An old plant that has been cultivated in gardens for centuries, I will say. The other one that I'm sure everybody is familiar with is blue flax. And our native blue flax is Linum lewisii. This is actually an image of Linum perine, which, you know, in the hardcore native plant list, people don't want you really planting Linum perine. It's a, a Western Europe plant, European plant, but still a good plant, but it will reseed everywhere. And I'm sure that Linum lewisii, our native species, also will kind of reseed. But the beauty of blue flax is that it is a very graceful, delicate, lovely plant that gives you a new crop of sky blue flowers every single day. And there are a multitude of them, usually starting about mid-May into June, into July, Usually by about the end of July, blue flax has pretty much kind of worn itself out. And in the scheme of things, like the gallardias, this is not going to be a long-lived plant in your garden. You may buy a little two and a half or three inch pot of blue flax, and it looks like, you know, a little fountain when you plant it. And you like it the first year. The second year, you like it even better because it's just so cute. And, just kind of dainty looking, but not dainty looking, and those blue flowers are just a sight to behold. Very simple flowers, but if you would get a hand lens and look at them really closely, those simple flowers would be beyond beauty. Then the third year, it is an apparition in your garden. It is just the fountain that you always dreamed of, and nothing could be prettier. The fourth year, when you go out there and start cleaning it up after the winter, it's a little thicker stemmed, a little woodier. It's not really coming out off of that old wood as nice as it did before. It's lost a little bit of that graceful form. And it is, in the words of horticulture parlance, O-T-H, which means over the hill. And so when a plant is over the hill, you have to realize that it is a plant, it is not a pet, <laughs> and that there are other linums, there are other blue flaxes that are either waiting for you to purchase and plant, or if you look around, you will probably see the progeny of your linum in the garden as little seedling plants which you can dig up as little seedling plants and plant them wherever you want. So one of my favorite blues singers is uh, Delbert McClinton. And one of my fa favorite Delbert McClinton songs is Nothing Lasts Forever. And this, that's very true when we're talking about a large number of plants. So remember the Gallardia and the Linum, two examples of what I call pretty much short-lived perennial plants that have their day, but when they are past their day, it's either time to look around for the self-sown progeny or spring for $2.99 to get a new linum and start over, okay? All is not lost. Mirabilis multiflora. This is a great plant. And I wish more people would plant this plant. This is hardy four o'clock. And uh, there are some beautiful specimens of this plant. I didn't see any at Spring Creek today, but there may be some there. There may be some specimens at the trial gardens at Perk, I'm not sure. 
There are a lot to look at in Kendrick Lake Garden in Lakewood, Colorado, which is a, I would say it's worth your while to drive down to Lakewood and visit Kendrick Lake Garden and I'll give you directions and everything later. There's a lot to look at at Denver Botanic Gardens. This again is a plant that doesn't really come out of dormancy until probably about late May or early in June. But it gets to be a big plant. And once this plant establishes, it does not need any irrigation. This is native to the southwestern part of Colorado and it will develop this beautiful blue-green foliage. And if there is a downside, it's that the little hardy four o'clock flowers are like their name indicates, four o'clocks. They really don't open until late afternoon. And they will be open all through the evening and early in the morning, then they'll kind of close during the heat of the day and reopen again at night. This plant is beloved by sphinx moths. They just love it. I really haven't seen too many hummingbirds in it, but I would think that it would be a possible hummingbird plant as well, especially since the sphinx moths love it so much. But their real attraction to it is that it doesn't open until late in the evening or late in the afternoon when they become more active. So that's why it's so attractive to them, I think. But this is a great plant. It will, over time, take up a lot of space. And so this is one of the very first of the Xeriscape plants that Jim Knopf, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jim Knopf's very first little sort of thin, soft-covered book called Xeriscape Plants for Colorado. K-N-O-P-F is how you spell his last name. I want to say maybe that book is over there, I'm not sure. But Jim really was, you know, included this book, this was, you know, 20 years ago in that book. And at that time, this plant was nearly impossible to find in a retail garden center. And now, thanks to growers that have really figured out how to cultivate this plant for container growth, we're finding it a lot more frequently. And it's a really good plant. So full sun, hot and dry, don't have to irrigate it. I'm gonna say you're probably gonna water moderately for uh, a year or a year and a half to establish it. And then after that, you know, it's on its own, very happily. Not a very good picture of our silver blade evening primrose. But here we have another group of plants that are indicating that they, you know, evening primrose tells you these are going to be evening bloomers. And this is the one that Plant Select uh, latched onto a number of years ago that has more of a silvery color to the foliage. Uh, it's great, but there's lots of these different oenothras or evening primroses that you could select that would work beautifully in your gardens. This is the little Mexican evening primrose, which is really kind of a misunderstood plant because this, you know, will be, get characterized as a bad plant from time to time because of its invasiveness. And I like to say, just like with soils, when people tell me that they have bad soil, I tell them, no, you have misunderstood soil. And when they tell me they have bad plants, I generally have the feeling that they are misunderstood plants. So a bad plant can be one that does have extreme invasive tendencies. But if you know that at the outset, and you can provide a place for that plant to do what it wants to do, which is not play nicely with others. <laughs> Have a place of its own, on its own, for itself, then that's kind of a winning plant. It's a win-win. So one of the other detriments, I think, with this plant and with most of the evening primroses is that they are completely herbaceous plants and totally dormant during the winter with no vestige of winter interest at all. They kind of disappear. So you ha do have kind of a bare earth policy. But if you have a problem area that is hot 
and dry and you want something to really fill that area and give you nonstop color from the middle of June to the first hard freeze, Mexican Evening Primrose will do that and it'll do it without very much maintenance. But that's the caveat that you have to know that this plant does have invasive tendencies. Now this is our true native evening primrose, Oenothra cespitosa, and what a beautiful plant. Now as you're driving on the highway, I mean if you're going out to Pawnee Buttes, you're gonna see this plant all over the place. If you're driving on I-25 between Colorado and Pueblo, you're gonna see this plant right out on the side of the road. And if you're driving during the evening, you're really going to see it because that's when it starts to open from about four o'clock on. Again, this is another plant that is beloved by the Sphinx moth. This is a fragrant plant. You have to get down on your belly, of course, to really appreciate it because it's not a tall plant. It's a low growing plant. It has that silvery gray, very fuzzy, hairy foliage, which gives it its adaptations to help it ward off, you know, the needs for a lot of water. I mean, this is a plant that once it's established, you won't have to water probably at all. So it's really good for rock garden areas maybe where it can kind of niche in in a hot, dry place. Uh, and you won't really notice that maybe it's not there during the winter when it's dormant. But another one of our great natives, and I think one of our classic natives. And one of the things I love about the evening primroses is the shape of the bud. I'm one of these people when they're gardening that to me, part of the enjoyment of gardening is the anticipation that you have when you're watching your plants, especially in the spring when they're coming out of dormancy and you've got peony stems that are emerging like some primeval beast out of the soil, or buds that are swelling on trees and shrubs, your clematis, when those buds develop, it's part of the pleasure is looking at those buds and anticipating what's going to happen in the next few days or weeks when they do open. So I like to, you know, embrace it all. The penstemons. There could, we could do a whole series on penstemons. We've got uh, between 25 and 30 native species of penstemons here in the state. And this state, of course, you know, doesn't get a lot of moisture in an overall sense. So remember that the native species of penstemons and many of the cultivated ones that have been bred from those native species are going to be really very drought tolerant and will need water occasionally, but only occasionally. This is the prairie jewel that was developed from Penstemon grandiflorus, the big shell-leafed penstemon, beautiful plant. This is little Penstemon pinifolius. I saw lots of Penstemon pinifolius at Spring Creek today and out at Pat Hayward's garden simply kind of sheared back from the top growth of last year because this is going to stay evergreen through the winter. It's all ready to go right now. And you've got that little tiny needle-like uh, foliage that kind of indicates why this is called pine leaf penstemon. I mean, you know, those names mean something. This is a true xeric plant, and one thing that sets this apart, I believe, from other penstemons is that for, for the most part, penstemons have a flowering period that predominates in June. Pinifolius will flower all summer long. I've seen it in full flower, long, long borders of it at Hudson Garden in August. So this one you get more extended flowering on. It's probably one of the longer flowering and showier of the penstemons. This is our native penstemon strictus. I took this up by uh, Ontario Creek last year. And is that a stunner? That is, I mean, it's gorgeous. And this is an easy plant to find in garden centers. Uh, and, but it is primarily going to bloom in June. 
Perovskia, Russian sage, not a native plant, but a plant nonetheless that loves it here. And over the past 15 years, I won't say 20 because I'm going to say, you know, it all started about 15 years ago when we started having this plant available to buy in garden centers. It was kind of a, like we didn't really know too much about this plant before then. And then we discovered, my God, this plant loves it here. Well, it's all because of its origin. It comes from a sister climate. It comes from the high steppe and um, in Eastern Europe, East, Central East Europe. And it loves it here. It loves our alkaline soil. It loves our high elevation and our clear days, lots of sun. It doesn't care if it rains. It takes very little to establish a Russian sage. And once it establishes, it, like the hardy four o'clock, is on its own. It can stand on its own two feet. I would say more problems than not with Russian sage occur because people plant it in too rich of a soil and overwater it. And if that happens, it gets floppy and it doesn't look happy. Put it in lean, dry soil water it moderately to establish it, and then leave it alone. And let it go through the winter in its tan state. We all have to recognize that tan and brown and gray and silver are colors too, okay? Doesn't all just have to be green all the time. That neutral palette is beautiful. We have to learn to love it because that's who we are in the winter. We are neutral, we're not Oregon. I lived in Oregon for five years. I loved it, but I love it here too. So Russian sage, easy plant to grow for us if we don't coddle it. It will oftentimes, after it matures, become kind of a pest with reseeding. And you can get root suckers out from that as well. But just try not to be too nice to it. And uh, I think it's become a ubiquitous plant for us. You know, junipers used to be our ubiquitous plant that we saw everywhere, and we were sick and tired of looking at them. And now, Russian sage, even though it, it has great attributes here, it's a triple X, true and blue, but there's, been a, there's a lot of it that's been planted. So we're becoming more familiar with it. And I think if we can, you know, plant it where we want it, where it really serves a purpose, but I don't think we need to overplant it. And uh, there are other plants as well, because I, I do think that there's been a little overload on this, just like with Carl Forrester feather reed grass. Paniotti said at Pro Green two years ago, if I see another Carl Forrester feather reed grass, I'm going to scream. So he's been doing a whole lot of screaming, believe me, because <laughs> there's a whole lot of that being planted. Another prairie native, Retibida columnifera, our prairie coneflower, a delightful little plant. You can find the sort of bronze petaled form of that as well and just a gorgeous little plant. The petals will hang on probably until very late in the summer on retibita, and then when they fall, you have this delightful little seed head that will just sway and dance in the wind that is very, very pretty. So a great little native plant, very, very xeric. Hens and chicks, these were your grandmother's plants. And I think the attribute about hens and chicks is they will grow where you think there isn't space to grow anything. Let's say you've done a little rock wall or even a little paving area where you want to niche some little plants in. And the beauty of this plant, and if we look at its scientific name, I don't have its species name on here. Well, no, just its uh, genus name, Semper vivum. Semper meaning always and vivum meaning green or burgundy as the case may be. So, but you're always going to have something there. You're not going to have the bare earth syndrome in winter with hens and chicks. They will be out there to greet you all through the winter. And when I was up at Pat's today, she had 
a beautiful, couple of beautiful groupings of them, and there's so many of them with so many variations. Some that just look like spider cobwebs with a lot of netting on them. She had this one grouping of um, hens and chicks that were predominantly a real jade green with a red center. They were just gorgeous. So look around, there's lots to choose from, and uh, plant some hens and chicks. And occasionally they will flower. They, you know, they will send up a long stalk, and there will be the little star-like flowers that are on the top. And this lady came into Ector's one day, and she said, I see you have hens and chicks, but where are the roosters? <laughs> and I quickly put together that she was looking for the ones that you know, they were, in her mind, the rooster hens and chicks because they had that sort of coxcomb-like appearance. So I learn something all the time from people. Sphoralsia, another prairie native. Copper mallow, cowboy's delight. Copper mallow is a great little plant. It's a native plant. And uh, again, starting to flower, I'm going to say, within about the next three or four weeks out on the prairie. And Cowboy's Delight, it always sort of signaled spring to them. So I love where these common names come from as well. This is a really nice little plant. You know, sometimes it can be a little tough to find. It's not the easiest plant to grow in cultivation for growers, but they're figuring it out doing a little bit better job of it. It was in our Plant Select uh, roster last year in 2009. And Partridge Feather, very pretty little plant. This is it in the uh, sort of the ground cover effect that it gives. And this is in the demonstration gardens down at Berthoud at the water, Northern Water Conservancy Garden. That's another great garden for you to visit. And those gardens are open to the public. You can self-tour yourself around through there. Uh, they have a whole plant select display garden area, as well as other, they have a lot of turf display plots, but just, that's a great garden. I visited there for the first time last October, and I was really impressed with it. I really, we had a great time. Now, another Tanacetum, and I apologize, this is not a great slide, is the Tanacetum nivium or the snow daisy. And that's the little white daisy-like flower that's on the, the uh, would be the left-hand side up here. It gets, you know, it's a taller plant. It will get to be probably about 14, 16 inches tall. And it reseeds like crazy. It will just, it'll flower like crazy and it'll reseed like crazy. And you'll get lots of little silver, feathery leaved clumps coming up. You just pull the ones that you don't want and keep the ones that you do want. But it really does fill in a garden. It blends well with a lot of different things. It's totally drought tolerant. It's easy to grow. It smells very tansy-like. It has a very aromatic um, fragrance to the foliage. And it's just you know kind of a fun little plant. Lauren introduced this really to kind of the, the area way back in the 90s. And it was one of her little plants that she grew in her garden out at Windsor. And uh, that's how I found out about it was, in, I think, in her first book, The Undaunted Garden. Now, this is the little plant, Zinnia grandiflora, that is the plant that is, number one, kind of hard to find in a garden center. But you will find probably little two and a half inch pots of it. It has very feathery little foliage, and it'll be a diminutive little plant when you purchase it. This plant probably gets killed from overwatering and trying to establish more than any other. It wants it hot, dry, sunny. It doesn't want anything fancy about the soil. The hard part on this plant is knowing how much to water, when to water, and I don't know that I have good guidelines for you with that. I would kind of, if I was planting it, maybe moisten the area where I was planting it prior to planting it. And planting it in kind of a little bit moister soil, not wet. And then watering it to get it settled in there. And then just kind of backing off 
and watering as you felt like you kind of needed to do. I think less water is better with this plant, even in establishing it. We'll start flowering usually, I'm gonna say about the middle of June. The flowers have a very sort of paper-like uh, texture to them. They're very thin and almost paper-like. The foliage is very fine textured. I mean, it's really has all of those classic examples of, of xeric plants. Fine textured foliage, silvery leaves, little hairs on the leaves, all of that that makes it adaptable to low water use. And the flowers last for a long, long time. Eventually, at the end of the season, they will start, sort of start fading out to the color. But again, these are great little flower sprigs to dry. They'll hold their color really pretty well if you don't let them start to get a little bit too far gone. And I have seen nice little areas, and I have probably about four plants myself that I've kind of, through benign neglect, have been able to get through for about, oh, maybe eight years now, and I have some nice sizable little clumps. But I think less is going to be more when you're trying to establish uh, Zinnia grandiflora. It's, you know, it's native out there where it's in no man's land out there on the eastern prairie. So that kind of is the hardcore core triple X plants. There are more, and we've got them all kind of broken out in this brochure, uh, not only perennials, but shrubs and ornamental grasses, even annuals, and a little bit of the watering guidelines. So those are the hardcore core ones that I wanted to show you. And there's a few more in the pamphlet. Plant this beautiful late flowering blue plant with an orange flowered Zauschneria. Just a gorgeous combination. It's a bronco color combination. <laughs> So, you know, show your true colors and it'll be blooming that bronco color combination during bronco season. What could be more appropriate? So the plumbago or the ceratostigma, great. And it also really kind of develops very nice fall color. It is gonna completely be herbaceous probably from about November on, and it doesn't come out of dormancy until a little bit later. But what an easy plant to grow and very adaptable. Sun, shade, it doesn't care. It's a great plant for under shrubs, an under, under shrub ground cover, um, or areas where you've got a little bit of ground to cover, but you're not, re you know, under shrubs, you don't really care if it's evergreen all winter. So, or as much, because you got the shrub to kind of take up part of that interest but it's a, I think that that's one of the most useful places to use it. The ice plants, great little ground cover plants, and there's a huge number of ice plants. Lots of them, you know, all over. We have Paniote to thank for really introducing ice plants to us. Many of them are native to South Africa where he has traveled many times and brought lots of germplasm back for us. This is the hardy yellow ice plant, the first of them to bloom, the one that is going to be the hardiest at a higher elevation, will probably be fine up to about 7,000, maybe 7,500 feet. Um, has wonderful winter color, usually finishes blooming, I'm gonna say by about the end of May. You're not gonna have this in, in flower anymore, but you will have evergreen, and then ever bronze foliage through the winter. And then we have our hardy purple ice plant. Doesn't like to go up as high in elevation. The flip here is that it doesn't really start to bloom until about June, and then it will bloom all summer long. So all kinds of ice plants that have arisen from probably these first two that we became acquainted with. This is uh, Table Mountain, one that bears uh, Paniote's name in the uh, species of it, and just a great plant. Look at that shiny iridescent color. They look like jewels, and the foliage is really quite stunning, very low growing, matte forming, and a great summer color. Dianthus. 
a huge group of plants, everything from little ground cover plants to taller plants to plants that kind of drape. They will all have evergreen or ever silver foliage. Many of them have a great spicy clove fragrance. They are typically early summer bloomers, late spring and early summer. They're not gonna bloom all summer long. When they finish flowering, you can clean off the flower stems and then you'll have beautiful evergreen or ever silver foliage. Just great little, great little plants. Lots of different dianthus. The plant on the far right, the gara, is what we're looking at here. Whirling butterflies, apple blossom grass, and I cannot tell a lie, this picture is a picture from England. Uh, it was the best picture of Gara, and it's still not a really great one, but Gara is in that evening primrose family, like the Oenothrus. So it doesn't come out of dormancy until late. But the beauty of Gara is that once it gets going, once it's warm, it's fast to grow. And it likes it hot, it likes it dry, it likes it sunny, and it's like a baby's breath, but it's like a baby's breath on a longer, more graceful stem, and it will fill in beautifully. When your oriental poppy goes dormant in the hot part of the summer, and it's disappeared from view, and you need a good companion plant for it that will kind of steal the show after it's gone to sleep because it's too hot, Gara is its great counterpoint, or baby's breath. Good old-fashioned baby's breath will work as well, but Gara is a great one to use like a baby's breath in many ways. A great mingler, that white color, and there are sort of pink tones available now, kind of help mitigate other colors and blends. Gazania linearis, another little glow-growing plant select plant. This plant if I would tout it for one thing, it's that you can oftentimes have this plant flowering in your garden in February, as early as February, and it could still be flowering in November. It is a very long flowering plant. Granted, at the end of the season in November, you're not gonna have tons of flowers, but you'll have the sporadic flower that'll still be there. And in February, you're not gonna to have tons of flowers, but it's coming awake from the winter and it'll start flowering. So another one from the Plant Select program, beautiful green, shiny foliage and cheerful yellow daisies, again, from South Africa, from those higher regions in South Africa. Here's the baby's breath, not the greatest picture. It's hard to get this where there's a good contrast in this this uh, concrete wall behind it isn't helping any, but I think you get the effect of what baby's breath uh, can do. It's the big filler spiller. And kind of like the Asclepius tuberosa, this is one that does not want to be disturbed once it's planted. It does put down a deep tap root. It resents being lifted and transplanted or lifted and trying to be divided because it's really not a dividable plant. It really comes from a single growing point. You would look at that big mass of baby's breath and think, oh, there's lots of different little plants in there. But if you follow that, those uh, stems, those branching stems back, it's basically coming from one growing point from a single crown. So don't try to lift and divide this plant. Just figure out where you want it and then kind of like with the Baptisia, that's where it's gonna be, that's where it's gonna stay, and other plants will have to accommodate it instead of it accommodating other plants. Helianthus maximilianus, that's the nice yellow Helianthus here, in with another one of those tall fall blooming asters. So this is late summer at Denver Botanic Gardens in the big O'Fallon perennial border there. The helianthus gets to be a fairly tall plant, but it's, you know, it is a prairie native. And so it's one of those perennial native sunflowers and just as tough as nails. And I've got quite a bit of helianthus maximilianus in my front garden. It's coming out of dormancy now. 
and it doesn't really flower, start flowering until midsummer. So it takes it a while, but then it's going to be the last, one of the last perennials in the sunny garden uh, that is flowering all the way probably until I'm going to say late September. Now the helianthemums, these are kind of hard little plants to get good pictures of, but they're little low growing sort of rock garden type plants. They're called sun roses. These I, this picture I took over at Paniotti's garden and it was a little bit, I can't remember, I think it was just late in the afternoon and they had kind of all kind of shut down for the day. But open little faced flowers, there's a little pink one with silvery foliage right over on this side, one of my favorites because of that silvery gray foliage. But cheerful little flowers that are, you know, really nice. They will flower probably starting in May. They'll flower through June and probably into July. When they kind of get finished flowering, you can just shear them back because that foliage is going to stay evergreen or ever silver for you the rest of the year. They really do have that evergreen quality. Daylilies. Now, daylilies are not hardcore xeriscape plants. But they are pretty water thrifty if they're planted correctly. So when you plant daylilies, you do want to add a certain amount of organic matter to your soil, making it a little more moisture retentive for them. They do have, you've all seen daylily roots, and they are those thickened sort of almost tuberous like roots. So they are good at collecting water and kind of holding on to it but they do want a moisture retentive soil and they do want to, when they are watered, be watered thoroughly. But I will tell you that during those two hardcore years of drought, daylilies took a hit if they weren't watered with some consistency and some depth. They get leaf scorch if they go too dry for too long a period of time. And I think that, you know, a good daylily is not an inexpensive plant to buy. You know, they, you know, a good cultivar daylily is going to cost you probably at least $10. They are thrifty in the fact that within about four to five years, you've got a lot of that same daylily day that you can lift and divide and kind of share with friends. So you can have the daylily exchange going on. Um, so I think that they're reasonable plants for water thriftiness, but I think that they're, you have to have an awareness that they're not what I would consider, you know, that hard, hard core xeriscape plant. Let's do a little work with the soil before we plant them, and then they'll be able to better weather uh, really excessive dry conditions with some help from you and a good thorough watering occasionally. But boy, there are so many, lots of different ones. Candy tuft, this is a tough cookie, very tough. And this is Ibera sempervirens. So the sempervirens, here we have again, always green. This is gonna be green for you all winter long. It's not gonna be white all summer long. You get your main color from Iberus, kind of starting just about now. They're already budded and getting ready to start flowering. So when these spring flowering perennials finish flowering, shear them back. Cut them back fairly hard. You want to keep encouraging new growth to come up from the base. They're going to set their flowers for next year, usually by the early part of the summer. So you want to have new growth coming out that's getting flower buds set on it, and then you can kind of ignore them for the rest of the summer. But if you just let them go, and you let those seed heads develop, and you let them trail out, they're going to become longer, leggier, woodier, and then when we have that hardcore condition in the winter with that sun coming down on those poor, strung out stems, they're going to start winter burning, and you're going to have leaves that are going to disappear sort of mid through the stem. You'll still have your flower buds all set out on that, 
on the ends because that's where the flower buds are going to initiate. And then in the spring, you'll have beautiful white flowers out on the end, and then dead stems with no foliage, and then some half-hearted attempted new growth coming from the base. So don't be afraid to cut your plants back after they finish flowering. Shear them back. Encourage new growth from the base. Keep them tighter. Keep them a little bit more confined. We want them to cover some ground, but your clumps are going to increase exponentially, and that's where you really want to see your growth, not just growing out nonstop on the stem. Epimopsis, scarlet gilia. We can, we can say one thing for this plant. It is a native. It does tend to be a biennial. You're going to have a rosette of foliage the first year. It's not going to flower until the second year. But when it flowers, whoa, look at that. Beautiful. And it is a magnet for swallowtail butterflies. They love it. Iris, German bearded iris. We're not talking about Siberian iris. We're not talking about Dutch iris. For really good xeric plants, we're talking about the German bearded iris. You know, they're not from Germany, OK? They were hybridized and developed and made commercial by the Germans. They did all the work with them. But these plants are native to Iraq, Afghanistan, Turkey, all of that Central Asian area there where it is hot, dry, the soils are not great. So these plants are from our sister climate. I went to see Mike Bone's uh, presentation on uh, their trip into Kazakhstan. And believe me, there were times I thought I was looking at Colorado. So that is our sister climate. And these plants, German bearded iris, do fabulously well here. So, but they're not low maintenance. Remember, you're going to have to lift and divide and replant them probably on about an every four year cycle. So you do want to kind of monitor them. And, but they will, you know, you can't kill an iris here, let's face it. You can grow it better than most people grow them, but you can't kill them. Iris spuria, you might have to look around a little bit for these. Common name for these are butterfly iris. These are even more hardcore than the German bearded iris. They have, like the German bearded though, a very short ephemeral blooming time, usually for about five weeks. And they do get tall, they do get rangy, they are pretty when they're flowering, and they do spread. I mean, you do have to kind of be on these all the time to keep them from taking over or charting. You know, they don't necessarily play well with others. They kind of want to take it all. Nyphophia, a regal torch lily. Fabulous plant. This is one that is in the Plant Select program this year. This is a 2010. This is not your typical Nyphophia. This is coalescence. Again, all of the Nyphophias, or most of them, are from South Africa. This one has, I think, distinctive foliage. It's a bluer green, a little bit more architectural foliage, very, very pretty. This shot was taken, I think, at Kendrick Lake Garden. It may be at Denver Botanic Gardens. But uh, again, Kendrick Lake is a garden you should all visit. Lavender. Lavender is really a pretty xeric plant. Remember, it's going to maintain its foliage over the winter. If we have an open, dry winter, water your lavender. It's like a little shrub. And if we have an open, dry winter, water some of your perennials occasionally. They will benefit from it. That open, dry winter can be tough. This would have been a really hard winter to do a lot of winter watering because it was so cold. And we had fairly good snow cover off and on through the winter. This was not an easy winter to do winter watering. So, but we, and we got, you know, a fair amount of moisture over the winter. But this was not one of our typical winters from, let's say, the last four. The winter before this one and the winter previous to that 
were the two driest winters that our state's ever recorded since it's been recording data. So the year before last, we got no moisture in January, February, March, until the third week in April. That's a long time to go without anything coming from above. But lavender, uh, again, you'll have to kind of clean it up in the spring because of maybe some winter damage, but it is a, a fairly good plant for drier conditions, full sun. That's blue cushion. Liatris, an easy plant to grow. And this one is not a Plains native, but this one is. These are really, I think, pretty good plants. Moderate, just moderate watering on them. They are definitely in that double X category. And um, fascinating thing about this is that they are in the daisy family. So those are little individual daisy plants going up the stem. And that they flower from the top down, not from the bottom up. So kind of a little, you know, conversational plant there. Lychnis coronaria, the plant that's in the foreground there, is a biennial. Moss, or rose campion is its common name. It will spend its first year as a little silvery leafy rosette. Then it will bloom in the second year with these bright magenta flowers that stand out in our intense light. And it will reseed freely everywhere. So if you don't like it where it's reseeding, just pull it up. It's an easy plant to get rid of if you don't like it. And it will oftentimes act as that nice interfiller plant. Catnip. This is the typical uh, Nepeta vicinii that doesn't get very tall. It's great to kind of do along a wall. It will trail out. It's rather low growing. But because not all Nepetas are created equal, we have the cat mints that get big. This is a little overexposed, but this is in the Water Smart Garden down at Denver Botanic Gardens. And this one is called Six Hills Giant, and it gets to be about three and a half feet tall. Most of the cat mints are gonna look their best in May and June. And you can cut them back after they finish that big flush of flower. It'll take them about three to four weeks, but they should reflower for you again. Oregonum, the little oregano's. This, I took this picture of this. It's probably not the best one that I could have put in here for this, but it's the best at really showing the texture of the leaves, the little silvery disc leaves, sort of greenish silver, and those thin little wiry stems the flowers are all gone on this. We're looking at this at the end of the season with its little sort of hop-like bracts that are hanging down that just rustle beautifully in the wind. I took this at Berthet at the Water Conservancy. This is this, this whole group of ornamental oregano's. Look for the ornamental oregano's at your garden center. The oregano's. This one is like Antarctica. You'll find others, other cultivars. There's a lot of variety in them, but these are great plants, wonderful plants. They hold up to our climate beautifully. They come back beautifully. They're easy to grow, and they've got a lot to offer. Peonies, everybody loves peonies. They're like Mother's Day, Memorial Day. Uh, they make us feel good. They're beautiful specimen plants. Remember to plant them like you do your daylilies in good soil. Uh, nourish them, water them occasionally, not all the time, but when you do, water thoroughly and deeply. Make sure they get some water if we have a dry winter in late February and March, because they're all getting ready to put up those flower buds then. You can see them in gardens everywhere now, putting up those big, thick stems, that beautiful foliage that's going to get even more magnificent. I love peonies. Remember the big doubles are going to be problematic if we have wet, 
weather in the spring because water collects in those heavy flowers, making them even heavier. So growth through grids are great ways to kind of offer some lateral stability to the stems. If you have a problem with wind, whatever, you might want to consider the single types. They're going to be a little more weather resilient than the big doubles. Here's our oriental poppy. Very, I mean, hey, what do they grow in Afghanistan? <laughs> <laughs> and believe it, Afghanistan is a sister climate. So oriental poppies are great plants for us, but they are ephemeral. That beautiful big tissue paper flower lasts for about 10 days, maybe. So they come and go quickly. They are beautiful to watch emerge. The bud development is beautiful, so there's a little extension of the interest there. And then after they finish flowering, the seed head is really very attractive. And I don't want you going out there and scraping it and trying to you know, make hashish or anything. But, uh, <laughs> but they are like, really beautiful plants. And just keep in mind, that they want to go dormant during the hot part of the summer. They do not, you know, that's how they escape. That's how they have adapted. So that's when they're going to have their dormant period, starting about the middle to the end of July. Usually mid-September, you'll see foliage re-emerging from the clump. That foliage will winter over. And then they'll throw out new foliage during the spring, look beautiful when they flower, and then go dormant again. So don't think that your oriental poppy is dying when it starts to get hot and it starts to go dormant. It's just getting ready to take it out. The penstemons in this category, we've got penstemons that are not quite as water thrifty as in the triple X. But all of the Mexicalics that we had in the Plant Select program, Red Rocks, Pikes Peak Purple, Shadow Mountain, these are great, great, still great water thrifty plants. Henson and Barbados, Scarlet Bugler, just a great plant. But again, these, the, the Mexicali types, the Pikes Peak Purple, Red Rocks, and Shadow Mountain, are going to bloom over a longer period of time. Barbados, not so long, pretty much June. Persicaria affinis used to be called polygonum affinis. Common name is Himalayan border jewel. This is one of those plants that is a workhorse. It is a little workhorse for the problem areas, especially if you have a slope that you want to not erode. You want it to kind of fill in, stay compact, keep the soil there, and have something there all year round. Would prefer full sun and hot and dry, could take some shade, this is the plant for you. It will flower early summer with these little bistort type flowers. The little seed heads will hang on over a long period of time. They're not unattractive. The foliage, I mean, the common name of this is not wheat. So it is a very, very interlocking, uh, you know, it's a wheat barrier, I think, in, in many instances, if you get it really established. And it will hold slow, and it will, you know, the flowers will, like, again, you'll have little brown spiders there in the fall, and maybe into the winter. The foliage will turn russet sort of a russet brown. You'll have to break it out and clean it up in the spring, but it is a tough cookie. Flomus cashmeriana, the tall flomus, um, a form of Jerusalem sage with beautiful purple flowers on those whorled. Leaves come out in whorls around the stem, and the flowers like that. This is a tall plant and a pretty water thrifty plant, again from Central Asia, Eastern Central Asia, so a kind of a sister climate plant of ours as well. Very architectural, very, very pretty plant. Can spread from the root, you have to kind of keep an eye on it. In the Plant Select program, uh, probably five years ago. 
Everybody knows creeping flux, flux of your water. Just remember, after this finishes flowering, what are you going to do? Shear it back. You're going to shear it back. We're going to take that word creeping and kind of modify our thought process about that. We want it to fill out. We want it to creep to an extent. But just like the candy tuft, if you let it get carried away, then you're going to get these brown areas in it where the stems die out. So shear it back hard after it flowers. It'll be much nicer. And there's nothing prettier than a whole lap of those little flux flowers. So get your magnifying glasses out. It may look simple, but when you get up close and personal, it's another world. Platy Coden, I think an unsung hero of the perennial garden. Very underused plant, very easy plant to grow, pretty much pest free. Low, uh, related to the companionless with that big bell flower, kind of delightful to children because of the inflated sort of uh, buds that look like balloons before they pop open and continue, you know, blooms sort of midsummer. That's what's nice about this. It kind of waits until sort of kind of that end of June time before it really starts to flower. And then in the fall, the foliage on this is great. But I apologize that I'm not going to get through all of these. But I think you kind of have the feel, don't you? about what we're talking about, and you've got a really good slide list here that, believe me, if you go to any of Lauren's books, Marcia Tatro's book over here, or just online, go to Plant Select and check out that website. You can also go, you can pull this brochure up online, and you may be able to get a little more information there. But just Google some of these different plants. Another resource that I would tell you to go to for really good information is David Salomon's catalog. His High Plains um, High Country Gardens catalog is excellent. And you know, when I first started, you know, learning about plants and wanting to know more, my first reference catalogs were White Flower Farm and Wayside Gardens. And I mean, I would read them cover to cover, and I would absorb all of that information and learn those Latin names. And that's a great way to learn about plants. Now, granted, those catalogs were really geared for Eastern and Midwestern gardeners, because we all know that they didn't know that we existed out here. You know, we were out here in the great American desert and people didn't garden out here. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm sort of exaggerating here. But, and this kind of came home to me when I was in Philadelphia for a perennial plant association symposium. And these ladies from Philadelphia made it very clear when they heard that we were from Colorado that Philadelphia was where gardening was all about. <laughs> Thank you.